when we're hungry, we make harsher moral judgments about people's transgressions. We're less charitable. We cheat more in economic games. Our cortex assessing the effects of pro-sociality, anti-sociality, and altruism and its evolution. And part of what it's doing in deciding how it feels about somebody else's plight is if your stomach's gurgling, if you're hungry, if you're in pain, that affects very cortical judgment type areas. We're smart. We're at the peak of evolution. We have this powerful ability to think. The brain is only the organ with which we think we think. Its job is not to win Nobel Prizes and to pass math tests. Its job is to get us to tomorrow. We do almost everything to avoid uncertainty. And yet the irony is that that's the only place we can go if we're ever going to see differently. But every time you take a step, your brain has hundreds of assumptions that the floor is not going to give way, that your legs aren't going to give way, that that's not a hole, it's a surface. So these assumptions keep us alive. How is it possible to ever see differently if everything you see is a reflex grounded in your history of assumptions? When we're under stress, when we're in an emotionally aroused state, we make stupid, impulsive decisions that seem brilliant at the time, affective emotional limbic layer too, influencing how your cortical cortex goes about its abstractions. It's not that abstract. It's embedded in the biology of all these layers. Climate change and genetically modified food and unsustainable living on the planet. And that takes a lot more thinking, kind of cognitive, slow, more effortful thinking. So your brain evolved to take this meaningless data and make meaning from it, and that's the process of creating perception. Everything you do right now is grounded in your assumptions. Not sometimes, but all the time. If you don't accept that, then you'll never create the possibility of seeing differently. Because nothing interesting begins with knowing, it begins with not knowing. Think about, think about, and if it's the right thinking about, suddenly your heart slows down. Suddenly your blood pressure goes down. Ah, the core of biofeedback is figuring out what sort of conscious states you can evoke that will affect your reptilian brain in a direction that's good for your health. That we are not instinctively built that way must be recognized if we're gonna get beyond the risks of not being built that way. We better accept that and understand it so that we can apply that in order to avoid the pitfalls of our subjective way of perceiving the world. To question assumptions, to doubt what you assume to be true already, especially if that assumption defines who you are, is to do the one thing that our brain evolved to avoid, which is uncertainty. We would rather hold on to assumptions that we know don't work, because that is safer, we think, than questioning them and stepping into a place that we don't actually know. We ridicule politicians for changing their mind because they got new evidence. What conscious active thinking can I mobilize here at this point that will cause changes in how my big toes blood flow is working in a case like that that is very conscious regulation of more autonomic, more ancient parts of your brain. Our brain is hardwired and the chemistry of the brain guarantees that we feel first and think second. If the brain jumps to conclusions out of emotion first and more, just assume that your first decision might not be the most informed one. That allows that information and the facts side of this dual system to play more of a role. I can only get from here to the other side of the room by passing through the space in between. I can't teleport myself to the other side. Similarly, your brain only ever makes small steps in its ideas. So whenever you're in a moment, it can only actually shift itself to the next most likely possible. And the next and most likely possible is determined by its assumptions. We call it the space of possibility. What's possible is based on your history. But in fact, it's a logical process of making small steps, changing your space of possibility by identifying and then questioning your assumptions. A logical process of making small steps Changing your space of possibility by identifying and then questioning your assumptions.
So this presentation is called Introspection with the subtitle The Zeitgeister's Guide to the Galaxy. Some of you know maybe where that comes from. If you don't, uh, I hereby introduce you to the novel by Douglas Adams, who uh, sadly passed away some years ago. He's one of my favorite authors uh, and the mastermind behind this piece of fiction, uh, which I believe to be one of the eight or ninth wonders of the world, if you will. It's an absolute must read. I hope you uh, have access to it in your language or can read it in its native English tongue because it is a beautiful kind of anthology of what it means to be human. And uh, that's, I guess, why we're all here. So I wanted to bring that into the equation here as a little bit of a humorous touch. We often talk about very hard and deep topics in the movement. We want to emphasize the use of science and technology. And to many people, that can seem sort of cold and detached. And uh, so I wanted to bring in a little bit of that humanity that we're all really here for. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to, you to join me on this journey into yourselves, uh, which I call introspection for a reason, right? OK, so introductions are in order. Many of you who have followed the movement will be familiar with this guy, the first person in the video. If you don't know who he is, he is uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky of Stanford University. He holds numerous uh, degrees in neurobiology, endocrinology. He has spent a great part of his life studying baboon troops in Africa, and some of his work has led to breakthroughs in the understanding of stress and how stress hormones work, not just in apes, but also in us humans. And so I find him utterly inspiring, and I hope you will do the same if you don't know him. The second person in the clip was <coughs> David Rupayek, who is an instructor at Harvard. He has also written several books, more from a sort of philosophical standpoint, but I find him utterly uh, uh, entertaining, and he knows a lot about his topic, so please go seek him out. I should also say that you can see most of the links to all of the videos here, and I do have a PDF document with all of the links that I'm going through. So I don't want you to take anything I say for granted. Um, go check out this information for yourself, right? Third person, uh, probably the coolest name in science, Bo Lotto. <laughs> uh, he is a creation thinker. Uh, he talks a lot about creativity. Uh, and uh, he is also a neurobiologist by trade. He has uh, several PhDs behind him. And he's also the director of an organization called uh, Lab of Misfits, which I encourage you to go check out as well. Right, that out of the way, who am I? <laughs> some of you may know me, some of you may not. I have been with the Zeitgeist Movement since about 2009. Um, and I have functioned for a long time as the co coordinator for the Danish chapter. I'm not so active at this moment in the chapter itself because it's kind of decimated a little bit. People are busy trying to make a living in this world. We can all relate to that, I guess. So the chapter itself is not really up and running at this point, but people are engaging in other areas of life with this train of thought that we're talking about, which I think is the most important thing. Um, it's not about the Zeitgeist movement, it's about getting out there and talking to people, right? So back in Berlin in 2015, I did a talk about uh, the brain and how it deceives us on a daily basis. This talk is still up on the uh, international uh, YouTube channel if you want to go check it out, if you haven't already. Uh, I talk a great deal faster in that <laughs> that I'm trying to do now because I had to cover a lot of topics um, in a very short time. So I'm trying to slow it a little bit more down now. Right. So since I watched this video last, which is about a year ago, it's got 10 new likes. So I'm like, whoa. Yeah, we're getting there slowly. Right. Okay. So 
This is going to be uh, something I call the five guidelines of engagement. And um, in the tradition of sort of marketing gurus, it's always a good idea to break things down into smaller bits, recognizable bits. So five is a good number for that. Um, it's the number of digits on your hand. And uh, you will relate to that instantly. And also, it's not 10, so you won't forget half of it throughout the way. So that's the idea. OK, so what is the first rule of engagement when you're trying to be activist uh, about these topics that we're talking about? Because that is what I'm trying to convey with this. So, And of course, these are my rules. They don't necessarily apply to you. It's uh, sort of a. Something you can run with if you like, right? Okay, so the first is don't be a douche. What does that mean? It means don't be an asshole, don't be an idiot. And it's often tempting. We get emotional when we are discussing with people and we get impatient and we let our emotions get the better of us as the three experts talked about in the intro. So it's always a good idea to remember to smile and be polite and don't judge people, all that stuff. I talked a little bit about this in Athens last year when I was trying to impose mind tricks on people uh, to varying, varying success. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't recorded because of some te technical issues, so I can't refer you to that. But it was kind of fun and I was trying to point to the love side of things that we are here because we care not just for our immediate family, but for the whole planet. So let's remember that in all the science and tech, right? Okay, so number two is understand your delivery. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that there are some ways that are more effective than others when you are trying to convey something. And um, the way you present your case is... Uh, much more important than most people think. And sometimes it's even more important than the message itself. So um, I'd like you uh, to meet uh, Derek Muller. Some of you may know this guy. He is an Australian. He has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Sydney. And he has two very successful YouTube uh, in edu education channels uh, known as Veritasium and Veritasium 2. Uh, he uh, uses physics and, uh, as his topic and tries to uh, educate people about physics topics. But what makes me very interested in what he's done is that his PhD is about how do we actually learn and how do we absorb the information. So he wrote a PhD about this and did a lot of testing. It's called effect Designing Effective Multimedia for Physics Education. And of course, this is a very set up experiment that he did, but I think it relates to a lot more than just children in school or students and so on. And I'll just go on and let him explain a little bit on how what he did here. In a typical study, students accessed a website where they took a multiple choice pretest. After the pretest, students were randomly assigned to see one of several online videos. The videos contained correct answers to many of the pretest questions. Immediately after watching the roughly 10 minute video, the students took exactly the same test. I also interviewed some students to see what they thought of the video. The most common comments were that it was clear, concise, and easy to understand. The students also increased their confidence in the correctness of their answers compared to the pretest. So, what about how much they learned? On the pretest, the average score was 6.0 out of 26, and after the video, the average was 6.3. Well, what was going on? It turned out students did not even correctly remember what was presented in the video that they had seen a few minutes earlier. They don't pay attention because they think they know it, and then when asked what they saw, they falsely remember their own ideas as what was presented. Is there a way to overcome this? Well, I thought students might pay more attention and be able to understand if their ideas were presented in the video. In interviews with students who watched this video, no one used the words clear, concise, or easy to understand. Most often, they said it was confusing. But on the post-test, the average score nearly doubled to 11 out of 26. 
When asked to rate how much mental effort they invested in watching the videos, students who saw the dialogue with misconceptions averaged a whole point higher than those who saw the explanation without misconceptions. Increased mental effort translated into more learning. It seems if you just present the correct information, five things happen. Number one, students think they know it. Two, they don't pay their utmost attention. Three, they don't recognize that what is presented is different to what they're already thinking. And four, they don't learn a thing. And finally, five, perhaps most troublingly, they get more confident in the ideas they were thinking before. Okay, that went a little fast. I realized that. So uh, there's a question, yeah. So there were two videos, right? Right. What was the difference between the second one and the first one? The, the difference between the first set of videos and the second set of videos is that in the second set of videos, it, he introduced misconceptions in the video. So the preconceived ideas of the students were presented in the video as opposed to just the correct data. And the results, which uh, I'll try to summarize here, and are that you, when you are just presented with straight up learning, you don't necessarily get the information, you only get the bits and pieces that you think you know, and then afterwards you repeat those. But if you are, let's say, cognitively challenged on your beliefs first, that confuses you, it throws you off, but it actually activates your brain in a way that makes you susceptible to correct that information. And that's why this is so interesting to me, because we often find ourselves in these loops with people. Nobody gets any wiser, everybody gets upset, and we get nowhere. So I think this is very compelling evidence to the fact that it's very important how you present your case, and it's important that you know what the other person is actually thinking, or even yourself is thinking. So I'll get into that a little, a little further down the line. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Um, don't be a douche, and of course, understand your delivery, which brings us to point number three, check your facts. <laughs> I know this sounds uh, obvious, and of course, most of us try to do our best, but uh, we can't always, of course, get our facts straight, but it's a good thing to think about what am I actually talking about right now? Do I even know what I'm talking about? Or where do I have my information from? So I think it's more prevalent than ever. We have uh, this rise of so-called fake news everywhere. This guy, who is now the leader of the free world, believe it or not, um, you know, he's accusing a very re re reputable CNN reporter of spreading fake news in this clip, right? Um, and the very same guy turns around the next day and talks about events that never happened, uh, such as the so-called terror attack in Sweden, which had all the Swedes going, huh? <laughs> What's he on about? And so... This is a growing trend in our world today, and this makes it even more important for us as activists in the search of truth and sustainability and equality and all these wonderful traits, that we at least have our facts straight so that we don't get caught up in these stupid games. Um, that's why I believe this is a very important fact, right? Now, how do we go about finding facts? Well, the internet is, of course, your friend and your enemy at the same time. Uh, Wikipedia, I guess, is familiar to most. It's not a perfect platform, uh, and you shouldn't just go to any wiki page and copy-paste the information, but it's a good starting point. There will be a lot of good information to find, and most notably, there will often be uh, sightings and links to actual sources, that can take you to closer to the source of what you're talking about. And I recommend making a folder in your browser where you simply just stack up these links in different topics so that when you find yourself in like a Facebook debate or anything like that, you can go, wait a minute, I think I actually have something to back up this statement. 
and you can go ahead and post a link. And in that process, you might actually help someone understand something better. So I think that's very important. So try to link as much to as much source material as you can. All right. What have we learned so far? Don't be a douche. Understand your delivery. Check your facts. Next step is know your opponent. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if you state your understanding of your opponent's position back to him and he doesn't agree, then you don't understand your opponent's position after all. And this might sound obvious too, but it happens a lot in conversations that we have a presupposed idea about what the other person is thinking or feeling or believing, and we're attacking that rather than the actual argument. So it happens to all of us all the time. So try testing your knowledge of the other person's view. Ask them, do I understand you correctly when you say? Because then you can clarify. Oftentimes you'll have people say, no, 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 you completely, I mean, how many here have had this conversation with people? Uh, when you're trying to convey these topics, right? Uh, you have to understand where everybody is coming from if you want to get anywhere. So it's very important to understand the argument of your opponent uh, so that you can actually address any flaws that might be, or even get wiser yourself in understanding the flaws in your own reasoning. Right. Okay, so now we're getting into a little bit more of this transaction going on when you're communicating with people, specifically when you are in the same room. And in my talk in Berlin, I talked a little bit about this process known as transactional analysis, which is a process used in psychotherapy. Um, it was coined by a guy called Eric Byrne. Uh, and he took some of uh, Freud's ideas and debunked some of those and developed a little bit more on those. And I'm not going to use this in a psychotherapeutic way here. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong. But it actually outlines uh, some very simple states of mind that we can all find ourselves in and that we can use and reflect upon when we are in a situation, uh, especially when we are in unfruitful sort of loop situations with people. So I'm going to take a little time and explain it, uh, not in detail, but so you get the gist of it. Um, and I can refer you to this YouTube channel called Theorem in Trees. Some of you may know it. I pointed to it in my last talk as well. And he has a series of videos uh, explaining the whole process of how transactional analysis works. It, the cool thing about it is it's very accessible. You don't have to have a doctor's degree uh, or even a PhD in anything. I can say I have no degrees in anything. <laughs> I'm not a scholar. I'm not a scientist. I'm not here to teach you anything that you can't readily teach yourself. I'm just trying to point you in directions of people who know a lot more than I ever will, right? Okay, so let's go into this a little bit. Um, transactional analysis assumes that we have sort of three states, mental states of operation, whenever we're engaged in any kind of interaction. So I'd like you to think um, in your head of sort of a mental image that you're living in a house and outside your house is a lawn and there is a naked woman lying there uh, because the sun is out and uh, so someone just swatted on your lawn, right? And so you can now think about what type of reactions you would have. And so transactional uh, analysis talks about that you can be in a parent state. That's one of the three states. Now, if you're in a parent state, you can be either controlling, meaning that your parent state is one of authority uh, in a sort of negative way. So in this case, if you were in your parent controlling state, you would look at the sunbather and be outraged. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. You're on my lawn and you don't have any clothes on. What is going on? That would be a reaction you would have in your parent controlling state. Now on the other side of this is the nurturing state. So 
Your experience as an adult or as a child growing up is more one of nurture. You might have a reaction that went, wait, wait a minute. Do you have sunblock on? You know, it's, it, can I help you with anything? Would you like a glass of water? So this is sort of the nurturing parenting role you might have. As you might gather, at the other edge of the spectrum is the child state. Now, the child state is uh, more immediate, and if you go to the sort of negative side, this is what is known as the adapted side. So if you're growing up as a child and you have a lot of a nose from your parents, can't do that, don't do that, you will be adapted to shame, and you might have a shameful response to the sunbather and go, oh my God, I can't look at that, she's naked, and you might draw the blinds, or you might even apologize to the person for accidentally looking at her lying there. So this would be a child sort of negative response. Now, on the other side of that, the more positive side is sort of the freedom-loving side that we all know from children, is that when the sun is out, the first thing they want to do is just rip their clothes off and go in the sand and in the sun and in the, the water, right? So if you would be in this child state, you might say, hey, I'm going to join her and just take off all your clothes and go out and lie next to her. Maybe she wouldn't even like that, but in that state, you're not even thinking like that. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Uh, these are sort of the... Yes, there's a question. The pervert state. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, everybody heard me. <laughs> no, 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 the well, pervert well, state no, is... No, you. Uh, where's the pervert state? Because uh, most people don't think like that. They, this <laughs> right. Only people from Tazatem come up with this. <laughs> well, for all intents and purposes, it is just an illustration. I might have used another image, but again, I thought, let's have some fun with it, right? But you can have the P mean whatever you want. You know, it's up to you eventually. Okay, so the keen observer might notice now that we still need one state uh, here, and this is known as the adult state. Now, the adult state is free from all of these emotional responses like that. It is a neutral and objective state, which is hard to obtain, but this is the goal of transactional analysis, is to bring you into the adult state where you are at peace with yourself and more... Uh, able to assess the situation for what it actually is and not be so colored by your emotional responses, right? So this is what it goes to. Okay, so let's have an example of a transaction in this case, right? So we have two people and let's assume that one of these people is in his parent state and when you are asserting your parent state, you are expecting a child response. It is a don't do that, or here, let me help you with that response, right? You're assuming authority over the other person. Now, if the other person responds in a child manner, like saying, thank you for taking care of me, or I know I did wrong, sort of, then you have what is known as a complementary interaction. You see, the arrows are pointing in the parallel direction. Now, these types of uh, interactions can technically go on forever. It can be a loop, it can be an emotional loop that you are in with someone. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a very bad thing. But it's a good way to identify and see what's happening here. Is there a certain dynamic in this interaction that is sustained this way? You might think about, I've, it's always the same with this person. I always end up in this, him or her doing this or that, or me doing this or that. This is known as a complementary interaction, and this is where you start thinking about how do I get to my adult state, because that is really the only way to break out of this loop, if necessary, right? Okay, let's assume that we have a different situation. We still have a parenting uh, position here, but what if the other person also assumes a parenting role in this case? Now, this is known as a crossed interaction for obvious reasons and these are within the field of psychology known to be very unstable so such interactions always end badly uh, in one way or another either they end with the two people simply just not interacting anymore or which is more frequent it ends with one of them shifting their perspective from parent to child or hopefully adult uh, but that's less uh, permeant in the field, right? So again, 
I'm not trying to sell you to any kind of psychotherapy here, but I think, these, I think we can all recognize ourselves in these different roles at different times with different people. And they're not fixed. You don't always act in a parenting way or always in a childish or adult way. They can interact all the time. But the awareness of that these states happen can help us move ourselves and the conversational partner out of these negative loops if they occur. You understand? Cool. Right. So, what have we learned? Don't be a douche. Understand your delivery. Check your facts. Know your opponent. And finally, respect your ignorance. Let me explain that. You're all, of course, very smart and wise people. I realize that. But some of the smartest people in the world, like Newton, Einstein, Fresco, uh, Stephen Hawking, all of those people typically who have propelled our world forwards in some manner, they seem to have one thing in common, and that is their humility and respect of their own shortcomings. To an extent, I mean, we're all humans and we have our egos and all that stuff, but this is a typical thing you'll find among scientists, is that they very rarely tell you how things are. They will tell you that, well, based on studies so far, there is an overwhelming body of evidence pointing to that and then state there's something. And this is not to say that you should disregard knowledge as such. It's just an attitude towards it. And it reminds me of an anecdote that Robert Sapolsky um, told at one point. Uh, apparently in the field of archaeology, uh, there is sort of a golden rule among archaeologists that when they discover a new site somewhere, which is very exciting and everyone wants to get in and they're excavating stuff, they have a sort of rule of thumb that they're not going to ex excavate the whole thing because they understand that their current methods might actually accidentally ruin something that would have been of great value. So they're going to leave a part for the next generation coming in that might have better tools or understandings than they have. And I think that's a, a great way of thinking about it, that there's no way you can know anything um, you can know parts of things all the time. There is never a true answer to anything. It's always an approximation in some way, right? Yeah? Yes, I see um, um, a potential contradiction between two and five. Uh, because uh, in two, you emphasize that... Um, we should know our delivery, so I think we should be sure of what we are saying. We mm -hmm. should uh, present ourselves as, I don't know, certain in a way. And in the fifth, you um, suggest that we, sh we put in, into depth what, uh, what we want to say. So how do you want to face your opponent if you... Um, I don't know, if you uh, put in doubt your own statement. Right, it's a good question. It, it's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for all of us, specifically because, like Bo Lotto says, the brain doesn't like uncertainty. We, uh, we shy away from that. We want to know when the next bus is going to come and uh, if it's going to be morning in the morning, all that stuff. So we make a lot of leaps and jumps Un unawares to ourselves unless we have become more aware of it. So it is a shifting away from always having to have the correct answer. And I like to put it this way, it's a shifting away from an answering culture to a questioning culture. And I think that's part of this transition that we're all looking for. It's not just about sustainable energy and everybody driving electric cars and, you know, joining hands and forgetting about borders. We have to overcome our own uh, sort of mind limitations, which is very difficult to do. So to answer your question, <laughs> uh, it is a process. 
And acknowledging that everything is a process also means sometimes stepping away. If you have someone that you can find out after a while that this is not bringing any of us anywhere, and I'm trying not to impose my views, but the other person is keeping on doing that. So if you are keeping yourself in your sort of adult state, and it's not having any effect on this parenting person over here, trying to belittle you or whatever, step away. It's okay. You don't have to win every argument. Uh, and sometimes self-preservation is, uh, is a little more important, right? I don't know if that answers your question, but I understand what you mean. Um, okay, let's see. Apologies for the technical glitch there. This sentence here has been dubbed in afterwards for the sake of consistency. To put it in a sentence, everything you believe is most likely wrong in one or more or even all ways. Now, the greatest minds understand this, and I think we can all do good to heed to that advice. To speak more on the concept of ignorance, here is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now, there's a fascinating frailty of the human mind that psychologists know all about, and it's called argument from ignorance. And this is how it goes. You ready? Somebody sees lights flashing in the sky. They've never seen it before. They don't understand what it is. They say, a UFO. The U stands for unidentified. So they say, I don't know what it is. It must be aliens from outer space visiting from another planet. <laughs> well, if you don't know what it is, that's where your conversation should stop. <laughs> you don't then say, it must be anything. Okay? That's what argument from ignorance is. Anyway, we were very close to the conclusion. So I'm just going to present you with the final Docker list. Never leave home without it. Uh, it's an easy way to remember those five uh, points, I hope. And I hope you took something from it. Um, the last clip I showed you here without the sound was uh, my good friend, I wish. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is the uh, director at the Hayden Planetarium in New York and is also a very capable science communicator. He's an astrophysicist, and I love his, his work, his uh, take on everything, really. So I also encourage you to check him out. And again, uh, in a few days, the PDF document with all of the links here is going to be available online and uh, hopefully in a truncated version. Uh, the recording of this will also be. So I will just uh, take a minute to say thank you for your attention and uh, Godspeed.